On November 16th, 2020, I died. I was killed far away from the gaze of the people who have loved me so much. Only my brother, the mill, and my sister, the miller's house, stood by me, shocked and scared that their turn might come soon. So it was said, we need to find the money to restore the mill and the miller's house, or we will have to demolish them too. Many are happy, because I can now be restored. Well, <laughs> that's not going to happen, since I have now returned to dust. The best you can hope for is a pastiche of me. Something like the Eiffel Tower of Las Vegas. Before telling you my story, let me introduce you to Mother. Her rich, sandy soil was perfect for pines to grow tall. We still see a few of them today. The Mascouche River runs through her territory and far away to other lands. Mother never liked that name. She preferred Mascutu, like the first humans she met called it about a thousand years ago. The ones you call natives left a few pots and arrows behind. The archaeologist who found them in 1986 thinks that they came from camps just next to where I am. I mean, <laughs> it was. After a few centuries of peaceful hunting, the Compagnie de Nouvelle-France founded the Seigneurie of Repentigny in 1647. Truth be told, not much happened. First land concessions only occurred 70 years later. Some settlers started clearing lots, but then things were pretty slow. It changed when my big brother was built between 1751 and 1755. The mill gave access to lumber, meaning it became easier for settlers to build houses. Around the same time my brother was built, the world went to war. Many French lords were returning to France after the war, and that could partly explain why, in 1766, the new owner of the Seigneurie was a British general named Gabriel Christie, who bought it from the wife of Le Gardeur, since he had just died a year before. Or maybe the Le Gardeurs were just in need of a bit of money, who knows? My big sister was built around that time. Gabriel Christie didn't live in the Miller's house, but his employees did. French-Canadian Ambroise Magnon was managing the estate and was even transferred seigneurial powers. Letters preserved show that the general corresponded in French with him. On top of the lumber, my brother started milling flour as well. General Christie was a prosperous landlord who had bought many seigneuries across Lower Canada. He may have run into a cash flow problem. That could explain why he sold to Jacob Jordan in 1785. I didn't really have the chance to make a portrait of him during the nine years he was the owner, since Mr. cared more about his mills in Terrebonne. Things started to become interesting, at least for me, when this gentleman, after hunting for furs all across the continent, decided to settle down in Mascouche. He must have been tired a bit deep pocketed. Anyway, that was very good news because a star was born. Me. I came into this world in 1795, exactly where I am now was standing. Peter Pangman even named me Grace Hall in honor of his wife. Isn't it lovely? I must have made a really good impression on people because this is when there was a beginning of something of a village with the arrival of the first English speakers. Sadly, my great friend Peter passed away in 1819 and left behind his beloved wife and son, John Pagman, who was only 12. In 1854, the feudal system was abolished and poor John was therefore the last lord of the seigneurie. He was a bourgeois who was enjoying the social life of private select clubs. That didn't mean he didn't care for me and the estate. Actually, he improved the mill's gear system, which helped to increase productivity. He also built the little church at the top of the hill in 1840. It's still there today. 
and it's one of the oldest Anglican churches in Quebec. It was also named Grace, after his mother. When John Henry took over the estate after his father's death, the Pangmans started to lose interest in me. I mean, they had expanded their empire and diversified their assets, so we were not the center of attention anymore. John Henry was putting more time and energy in St. Lynn, where he built another mill, a chassis factory, and where he was the president of the railway. In 1880, when he was decapitated in a train accident, how ironic, the business was so all over the place that his children didn't want us and put the estate up for auction. The Corbeys were completely different than the Pangmans. They weren't rich, nor had traveled the world, but were hard-working locals who put up the money and bought the estate. Their vision was to make the best out of what we could offer, and they did. They invested in a steam engine that tripled the mill's production. Take that, John Henry. They also improved the dam by rebuilding it in poured concrete. That prevented recurring spring floods from happening. One of them had caused the tragic death of a little boy in 1885. As for me, they kept me exactly as I was. In 1927, while the Corbeil's heirs were working and enjoying life with me, this gentleman, Pierre-Georges Roy, an important historian, changed the course of my life by publishing this book about historical houses where we appeared. What made Mrs. Colville fall so deeply in love with me after reading that book, I'm not sure. One thing I know is that she wanted me badly. She made numerous attempts to buy the estate from the Corbeys, but they rejected all her offers. They didn't want to move. Business was good. Life was good. In an ultimate effort, Mrs. Colville convinced the Corbeys to sell her the estate. She had big plans for us. I became this arts and crafts inspired manoir that won the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada's first prize for restoration of residences. Some newspapers were citing us as one of the most beautiful estates in North America. After a long career in milling, my brother took his retirement and became a garage and my sister lodged Mrs. Colville's chauffeur and other members of staff. I finally entered modernity by receiving electricity. What's little known is Mrs. Colville was a gentlewoman farmer who liked technological improvements. She even participated in exhibitions and won prizes. In 1932, Le Devoir published an article where I was mentioned as a historical house. The following year, Mrs. Colville tried, for the first time, to have me recognized as a historical house, part of the built heritage. A few years later, in 38, she invited the Historical Society of Joliet to visit me, but again, her efforts for some official recognition and, of course, protection were in vain. At the beginning of the 50s, Mrs. Colville's health was declining, and she sold the estate to the St. Gabriel brothers. The project the brothers had in mind was to build a seminary for the future priests of their congregation. The school and gymnasium were built in a way that we were now hidden behind them. Students didn't have access to us. That was reserved for the brothers and for the teachers when it became a secular school in the 70s. In 1973, a group of youngsters wanted to promote historical sites in Mascouche, and of course, we were part of it, but it didn't work out. Five years later, a group of citizens signed a petition, and even the mayor of the time wanted to have the estate classified and protected. And that didn't work either. After an evaluation of the heritage potential mandated by the city of Mascouche and the Ministry of Culture, the Historical Society of Terrebonne presented a project that would have prevented again what happened to me last fall. Guess what? It was denied. Surprisingly, contrary to Mrs. Colville, the brothers never wanted to have me or the estate recognized as part of the heritage. Actually, they were quite opposed to it. Why? Because having us protected would have meant that they could not have developed the estate as they wished. 
Also, they feared that us being cited as historical would bring a flow of unwanted strangers. Simple as that. At least, the brothers took care of us and maintained us in good condition, as opposed to what happened after. When a venture capital group bought us from the brothers at the end of the 80s, numerous other attempts to have us cited and protected failed again. After surviving two centuries, the mill's gear system was retrieved and lost. How is that even possible? The entire estate was not being taken care of. I mean, that vinegar tree there didn't grow overnight like the Berlin Wall. Would you have let this happen to your house? Am I bitter? Well, I'm not happy with the way I ended, but I try to be positive by hoping that my tragedy was a wake-up call. What I am is scared. Scared that other heritage buildings find the same fate as mine. You know, I was the superstar of Mascouche. Everything is or was named after me there. A school, a municipal district, a case pup. I have welcomed film shootings, a Canadian prime minister, and the royal family of Luxembourg. If this wasn't enough to protect me, what is? And what about the other buildings that may not have the same illustrious past, but are witnesses of a different time? How can they tell us about who we are if they disappear? Unless you think a plaque can do the trick? <laughs>